Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are on this planet, and uh, welcome to the SETI Institute Hangout. I'm Frank Marchis, I'm a senior researcher at the Carl Sagan Center at, of the SETI Institute, and I'm also the host of this Hangout. So the goal of our Hangout is to share with you, the public, and our SETI fans, the excitement of science and planetary science in general. So today we are going to talk about a very rare and unexpected event that happened last week in uh, Russia. And for this I have uh, two uh, renowned planetary scientists. First on my right, Dave Morrison, David Morrison, director of the Carl Sagan Center. Hi Dave. Hi. And uh, senior, senior scientist at the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Dave earned his PhD in astronomy from Harvard University and is very known for his work on the risk assessment of near Earth uh, objects such as asteroids and comets. Uh, on the right, we have Guy Consomagno. Hi, Guy. Hi, good to be here. Uh, Guy is a planetary scientist at the Vatican Observatory, so I, could, I should call you Brother Guy. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Guy got his degrees at MIT and University of Arizona. His research is centered on the connection between meteorites and asteroids and the origin and evolution of small bodies in the solar system. So we're going to start right away with the, main, the topic of this discussion. So could you please, Dave, describe to us what happened uh, Thursday night, Valentine's Day, or Friday morning in Russia? What happened was unique and scary and spectacular because it's the first time in a century that any bolide, any meteor, any object in the sky actually caused damage in the ground. This one came in right over the city of Chelyabinsk in, in Russia, a city of more than a million, and it exploded at an altitude of about 10 miles above the surface, uh, lit up the whole sky in the daytime, and actually produced damage and casualties on the ground from the force of the explosion. So when you say this is the first time in the century, uh, could you give us a previous events that happened, what has been reported, why, why this one is really important compared to others? It's really, this is quite rare. The one example that scientists have, have known about for many decades of an impact like this, an explosion in the atmosphere, was from the Tunguska region, also in Russia, in Siberia, in 1910. And that was uh, even bigger, and it would have caused terrible damage if it had taken place over a city, but since it exploded over a wilderness, it, uh, it really did very little damage. But it was a big explosion. It was, uh, it was about uh, 100 times bigger than this one. Uh, so this one was the second biggest. And they both happened to hit Russia, which seems to be purely a coincidence, but sort of interesting. Okay. There have been a couple of other events that we know existed which could have done damage if they'd hit where people live. There was a meteorite fall of, of iron meteorites in China about 10 years ago that basically missed a city by a, a, a few tens of seconds, but in fact landed in the desert where we got lots of nice pieces, but nobody was hurt. Uh, one that caused a small crater in rural Peru about five years ago. A uh, couple of big blasts that occurred in the, the jungle in Brazil in the 1930s again. It's, I think, partly the fact that there are more people and we're covering more of the surface of the Earth that we're prevent, presenting more of a target. Okay, so we have a, because we have more numerous on this planet, we have more reported events like this. We also have the, the satellites, the spy satellites, the surveillance satellites in space that are looking down on the Earth all the time. And they see a lot of these, these meteors exploding in the upper atmosphere. Um, things as big as the Hiroshima atom bomb, but no shockwave reaches the surface, and so no one notices. Uh, this one was big enough to get down closer to the surface and do damage. So when you say that to do the, it, did, it, did, it did damage, what do you mean? What, what kind of damage did have occurred over there? The explosion took place in the sky, and it was brighter than the sun. You see the videos, and everything just goes completely blank for a few seconds, and then Nearly a minute later, the shock wave hit the ground, and the main effect was it broke glass, broke window glass, and if people were standing next to a window, they could be hurt by broken glass. It's interesting. An, an event like this would not cause any casualties if you were out in the countryside. 
but we are hurt because we live in buildings and behind glass doors and windows, and, and that can break. It's the same way in an earthquake. If you were outdoors in an earthquake, it would be unlikely to cause you any harm. But if you're indoors, the building may collapse on you. So do we know if any pieces of this meteor reach the surface? There is uh, reports now coming out of Russia of people having collected small bits and some of them, again, none of this is in the, in the published literature yet. It's all on the internet. But what we've seen, they look like ordinary chondrites. Uh, I believe a report from the Vernadsky Institute in Moscow has said that these are of a type called an L chondrite, which is the most ordinary of the ordinary chondrite. But again, we're looking to have this confirmed. The whole process of testing a meteorite, finding what it's made out of, how we're going to name it, this will take months before we really know for sure what we've got in our hands. Does this help us know where it came from? Um, not directly. We know where it came from from a much better direct evidence, which is with so many different films and so many different videos, you can triangulate backwards and follow the orbit from where it landed, where it was seen going across the sky, into an orbit that takes it back to the asteroid belt, the inner part of the asteroid belt. And that's where the S-type asteroids are. That's where we're pretty sure the, the source of ordinary chondrites comes. The curious thing about this is we call them ordinary chondrites because they're the most common that we have in our collections that we see to fall. How do we know that that's actually typical of what's out there? We don't know that. The fact that we were able to trace this and to show that it comes from the asteroid belt gives us confidence that the collections we have, the pieces that we have in our collection, maybe aren't all that different from what's in space. So we started with a meteoroid which was 50 meter, 30, 30 meters diameter, and it dislocated in the upper atmosphere, and we get species. You, you just showed me a picture a few minutes ago. Well, they're, they're about that big. Yes, that they're, big. they're, you know, a, a centimeter or less. Could we expect to see any bigger picture, find any, uh, any bigger uh, fragments? It depends on how strong the original piece was. Iron meteorites, when they hit the upper atmosphere, stay together, they stay coherent, they can make a big crater. That's where meteor crater came from. The range of strength among stony meteorites varies all over the place. Sometimes they will fragment totally into dust. Other times they will fragment into these small pieces and you'll have a strewn field scattered over miles as the biggest pieces travel the farthest, the smaller pieces get dragged down. Uh, there was a, an impact in the Sudan in 2008 where the strewn field was several kilometers across, but all in a nice line. And there are historic meteorite falls that have these strewn fields. So as what really matters is not only the size of the, of the, meteorite, of the asteroid, but also the strengths of this, of this body. Because the thing we know from seeing the meteorites in our collections is that they're full of cracks. Okay. And they've been shocked. They've had, you know, they've been hit a number of times. Most recently, whatever knocked them out of the asteroid belt, it got them on an orbit that eventually could be perturbed into an orbit that crosses the Earth. And then they get shocked again when they hit the top of the atmosphere. You notice the, the sound, this, the sonic boom that caused all the damage. Why is there a sonic boom? because the meteorite is hitting the atmosphere faster than the air can get out of the way, faster than the speed of sound in the air. And that's what sets up the shock, and that it's, it's got to slow down really fast in order to get the air to move out of the way. All of that energy of slowing down, kinetic energy, gets turned into heat, and that's why it explodes. This, this asteroid was estimated to be about 10 meters in diameter, which doesn't seem very big, like a, like a house in size, but it was coming in so fast, it had so much energy, when it exploded, it was equivalent to a half megaton nuclear bomb, something about 30 times the size of the Hiroshima atom bomb, not because it contained explosives, but just from the energy, the kinetic energy of this object plunging into the atmosphere. If you remember your high school physics, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, the velocity squared. So you have a lot of, of velocity and then you square it, you've got a big number. Okay. So people have seen it in Russia, but also I heard it has been detected as well using instruments all around the world. Could you tell us a little bit about this? this uh... Well, when you get a, a, uh, an explosion like this in the atmosphere, you create a shock wave, as we know, that hit the city of Chelyabinsk 
but this shock wave in effect propagates clear around the world and it produces uh, very low frequency uh, oscillations called infrasound and these can be picked up at great distance by the detectors that are made for that purpose and that's one of the best ways of, of calibrating the impact of deciding how much energy it actually was from these stations that pick up the uh, the weak attenuated shock wave as it travels around the world. The low frequencies travel the best, as anybody who lives in an apartment knows. You can hear the bass from the stereo upstairs mm -hmm. and you can't tell anything else. Well, we're here in the bass. We're here in the low frequencies of the explosion transmitted around. So what's the next step? Now we, uh, we know this event happened. Um, what scientists will be capable of doing? Are, they, uh, are we going to quantify better this can, how this kind of event happen, or how frequent, frequently they can happen, or what's the, what's we, what's the excitement? In, in well, we, we want to know, of course, where the object came from, and, and Guy has talked about that, and how big it was, and then you relate that to the observations that astronomers make of the small asteroids in space. We think this sort of thing must hit the Earth every 50 years or so. But of course, if it came in over the ocean, uh, you probably wouldn't even know about it because there's nobody there to, to be damaged. Except if the infrasound uh, station can hear it. Yeah, yeah. If, well, we haven't but, had infrasound stations for that long. Right. So um, we think it's an unusual event, but one that anybody could expect to happen at least once in their lifetime. And if it were a little bigger, then it could do real damage. I don't want to minimize the fact that you don't want to get cut by, by broken windows, but if it were strong enough to actually knock down buildings, it would be the equivalent of a, of a nuclear attack. The crazy thing is, of course, we now know these things occur, and we, one of the things Dave is famous for is trying to work out the, the probabilities. Here we've got a piece of ground truth. We have an event that we've really well observed. We saw how big it was. We saw how big a shock it wave. We saw what kind of signal it gave to the, the, the microphones around the world. We can now calibrate other events compared to this well-known event. For the last 15 years, astronomers have been carrying out a survey, the Space Guard survey of asteroids, near-Earth asteroids, the ones that can eventually collide with the Earth. And we've done a very good job of finding the bigger ones, those larger than about a kilometer in diameter. We found nearly all of them, and fortunately not one of them is going to, uh, to hit the Earth, in our lifetimes at least. Uh, but, so we found about 10,000 near-Earth asteroids, but there are more than a million altogether. And the fact is that we need bigger telescopes to find the smaller ones, but even then, if it came to a, an impact like this one in Russia, uh, I don't think we could do anything to, to deflect it, to shoot it down. If we knew in advance, even a few hours, even perhaps a few minutes, then people could take some shelter and there wouldn't be any, uh, any casualties. So when it comes to objects this size, we're not going to try to shoot them down, but we do want to be able to warn people and, if necessary, give people enough warning that they could evacuate just like they do when a hurricane is coming. There was a wonderful comment you were making uh, earlier about the boundary line between how big does an object have to be? Well, you, you describe it. Well, it's just, uh, you know, we, we talk about this. What is the threshold for damage? And one way we say it to each other, me and some of my colleagues, is, well, at what separate size of a predicted impact would you go toward it? To find out what's there. As a scientist, to see what happens. And at what size predicted impact would you go away because you're scared it might hurt you? And this one of Chelyabinsk is right on the boundary. It wouldn't have hurt anybody if it hadn't been for the glass windows. And it really was an exciting opportunity for, for a scientist to see what something like this is like. But if it were a little bigger, I can assure you, we would be going away just like everyone else to get out of the way. There's another aspect to all of this. We've got the meteorite pieces. We know they're ordinary chondrites, or we're pretty sure they're ordinary chondrites. An ordinary chondrite is about 10% metal. That metal is mostly iron, but a good fraction, 5 to 10 percent nickel, and in the parts per million range, every other element in the periodic table that is normally found in nature is a metal. Things like platinum, iridium, gold, silver. Now, it's a really simple calculation that any high school kid could do. 
If I had a 100 meters radius object, what's the volume of that? 4 thirds pi times 100 cubed. That's the volume. Multiply it by 3 times 10 to the 3, which is a typical density, to find out how much mass you've got. Divide by 10, because 10% of it's metal. You're talking, for an object even that size, of a zillion tons of useful, interesting, mineable, sellable materials. Mm -hmm. And there are, as far as I know, at least two different companies out there right now talking about going to these near-Earth objects and exploiting them. Yeah. And it'd be, it'd be much better to, to mine an asteroid than to you know, dig up your backyard, which you may have other uses for that backyard. If you're capable of going there, I'm bringing back the material. But if you add up the amount of material, the current value of that material, you know, a one kilometer object, I've done the numbers, run the numbers for it, it's trillions of dollars worth of material there. It would probably cost trillions of dollars to exploit it. But if you can drop that by just an order of magnitude, then suddenly it's well worthwhile. Well, I understand that uh, when people evaluate the economics of anything like, like mining for something, it's not just what's there, it's not just what it takes to dig it out, it's what it takes it to refine it, transport it, and make it usable. And at least my opinion is that the space resources are never going to be worthwhile to bring down here on Earth. On the other hand, if we had a robust space architecture, if we were exploring the solar system, if humans were expanding beyond the Earth, then the asteroids are the perfect source of raw materials. And I think the in intermediate case is if you're mining them in space, refining them in space, doing the manufacturing in space, then it might be worthwhile to bring it back to Earth. So basically you're telling me that near-Earth asteroids are friends, but they're also foes. <laughs> it really depends how, what the trajectory and what the orbit are, yeah. right? But for us, the real interest is they're the leftover scraps from the formation of the solar system. If you've ever been to a place where they're building a house, I was a, a baby boom kid, you know? When I was growing up, all the fields around Detroit were being converted into subdivisions, and I grew up in one of those subdivisions. You'd play in the backyards of the houses being built, and you go, oh, they're getting the pink tiles in their kitchen. Oh, because you know what's inside the house from the scrap heap in the backyard. The asteroid belt is the scrap heap of the solar system, and it tells us what's inside all of the other planets. Okay. Um, I've, I've get some questions online. Uh, one of the questions I got is, do we have more of these events? Because people have the feeling that there is more of this impact uh, happening recently. Like, is, it, is that true or is it just purely coincidence? I think we're more aware of it <coughs> because of things like Twitter. <laughs> yeah, the fact is that, uh, that we can calculate how often it's a Hiroshima-sized object explodes in the upper atmosphere about once a year. We, when I started in this business, no one dreamed that was true. Uh, we had no data, we had no information, and we went, in fact, to the, uh, the military running the surveillance satellites in the early 90s after the end of the Cold War and asked them if they saw evidence of these, these meteors in the upper atmosphere, and they said, sure, we've been watching them for 25 years. And uh, okay, now they release the information. Mm -hmm. So, but people simply were unaware. Same thing with this. And people including us, including yeah. the scientists. This, this flyby also on February 15th, by coincidence, of this asteroid uh, DA-14. Um, it was pretty close, three times the diameter of the Earth in distance. Underneath the orbit of where the GPS yeah. satellites go. That sort of thing happens uh, every few decades. We never saw it before because we weren't looking. They say one of the differences between the dinosaurs who went extinct from an asteroid and us is the dinosaurs didn't have telescopes and they didn't have a space program. We have both, so we can predict these things and ultimately we could protect ourselves. And the Congress of Dinosaurs was run by a bunch of dinosaurs as opposed to our Congress. Well, I won't go there. <laughs> So we have more of these events recorded by the public as well. I mm -hmm. mean, I, um, if you surf, like you say, Twitter, Facebook, you see now picture of Meteor and so on. So is that, are these, these images or movies interesting for the scientists? Should they share, share them with us? Oh, yeah. Um, but the first really well-oriented 
impact was only about 1960, and that was done in Eastern Europe with a, a network of cameras. In those days, you had to develop the film every night, and most of the films were boring, but you, it was an enormous waste of film. It was tough to do. Nowadays, we've got videos where, you know, if it's a bad night, you can throw the video away. The electrons are cheap. A really great modern example of such an impact occurred in 1992 in... Uh, the Eastern United States on a Friday night in October. What happens Friday nights in October in Pennsylvania? High school football games. So we've got hundreds of videos of football game going on and suddenly a flash of light. We know where they were because we know where the football stadium was. The, the video cameras were all time stamped. And from this, we could trace the orbit of this fireball as it went back to the asteroid belt in the orbit forward as it hit the back of Margie Knapp's uh, Chevy Malibu sitting in her front yard in Peekskill, New York. And make the connection. This rock underneath the car was part of that flash of light uh, seen over West Virginia. That's what we did recently here. But Peter Janiskan did that uh, for the Californian meteor, for instance. The, 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 the Sutter Mill one, yeah. Sutter Mill and also the second one. He also mm -hmm. found uh, from his uh, survey, Hall Sky survey, use of them. In fact, he managed to identify the location of the frag possible fragment and then found the fragment very quickly. And in fact, the fact is, the more of these you have, the more tightly you can constrain it. Because every data has a little bit of error attached to it. And the way you beat down the error is by having more and more data points. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions on Google Hangout? Uh, that, that's a real good question. Uh, and there was a question or heard, you should probably repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. The question is, do we have the capability of defending our planet from impactors from space? And it's a heck of a good question because we're learning about these, these objects. And absolutely, the first step has to be to find them. If you can't find them, you can't do anything to defend yourself. The, the second... first priority is to find them. The second priority is to find them. The third priority is to find them. But then you have to know what you're dealing with. Um, if, you, if you sent Bruce Willis up with an atomic bomb to blow up an asteroid, besides the fact that atomic bombs are really wimpy compared to the energy in these asteroids, you have to realize it might not be the smartest thing to do. All of our data have slight errors. The best we can do is give you the odds that something's going to hit. When the odds hit 50%, then it's time to be worried. If you blow up a body that has a 50% chance of hitting the Earth, you've gone from a 50% chance of hitting or missing to a 100% chance that half of it will hit. Mm -hmm. Is this an improvement? To, to answer the question directly, we know if, if we had a discovery of an object that was threatening to hit the Earth, and we had decades of warning, even if it were fairly large, we certainly have the technology in principle to deflect it, to change its orbit, so when that date comes and it was supposed to be in the same place as the Earth, it either gets here a little early or a little late. And it is, of course, much easier to change the orbit of the asteroid than to change the <laughs> orbit of the Earth. Right. In principle, we could do it, but we haven't actually spent any money to develop the technology to go about it, and it's something because that we, we should have, test. Yeah. Because we don't have the motivation. Well, as soon as we get the motivation, if you have yeah. kind of an asteroid, no, if you know that one of these asteroids could impact Earth, we will get the motivation. To That's do right, it. and then you would be playing catch up on the technology. How much time do you have? Mm -hmm. If you had a 10 year warning, you would need to have that technology ready to go to deflect it. And it would be very interesting to see what would happen if somebody gave you 10-year warning, said, you've got to move it, and we said, uh, well, we kind of know how, but we can't do it in 10 years. Yeah. So the foundation, the foundation B612, has kind of developing technology or ideas to deflect asteroids. The, they are still at the level primarily of the survey, because as I said, that comes first. And they're trying to raise public money, subscription money, I think they'll succeed to build a very capable infrared telescope in space that can 
take our discoveries from the 10,000 asteroids we've found so far to at least 100,000. It's a very efficient way to do the survey. But it still leaves open the question, so you find something and you want, you think you need to protect the Earth, who's going to take the next step? Will it be the military? Will it be the UN? Will it be the US? We really haven't worked that out. Question I'll throw at you knowing the answer, because I've heard your answer. How many people on the face of the Earth right now are employed looking for these guys? We have made great progress. Uh, Fifteen years ago, the number of people employed in, in trying to save our planet was about equal to one shift at a McDonald's restaurant. <laughs> Nowadays, we have the equivalent of two shifts at a McDonald's <laughs> restaurant. The two that is, is what the, the, the population of the world is willing to commit to saving our planet from a cosmic impact. And this has, I mean, we, a lot of, those, of this idea is to survey first, okay? You said that it's very important. And he has also, once, on, on, another, on one hand, we find an impactor, but on the second hand, we also have uh, more information about the, near, the vicinity of our planet. We have orbits of uh, near-Earth asteroids and hopefully the composition. So it's scientifically interesting as well. I, what I want to say is that when we, you say these two shifts are dedicated to search for, two McDonald's shifts are dedicated to search for near Earth asteroids, it's also the population of, peop, of scientists which bring new data in the, for us, for the scientists to find these new uh, these asteroids. It's not that much. It's definitely not, not a lot of people. Any more questions? But they're really smart, and that helps make <laughs> up for it, right? <laughs> are you part of those? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of you. <laughs> uh, any questions? The reason we can be sure, yes. I do oh, know how, for how do we, sure. How do we know for sure that it was a meteorite? We only know if we actually have the pieces in our hand, because the whole boundary between what's a meteorite, what's an asteroid, what's a comet, has become blurred. When I was a student, we knew the difference very clearly. Now we've got too much data. Now we've found things that are in the asteroid belt, but every now and then give off a tail like a comet. Now we've found asteroids that have a lot of water in their spectrum that make us think if they did come close to the, to the sun, they would be a comet. The, the nice, neat boxes that we used to put things in when we were kids turn out to not really describe reality very well. That's why we had to shift what we call Pluto. Mm -hmm. But let, let me say, although you're absolutely right that, that getting the piece is the final deciding element, the object that came in over Chelyabinsk behaved just as we would expect a rocky asteroid to do. The way it decelerated in the atmosphere, the altitude to which it exploded, this is, is dictated in considerable part by what it's made of. So it's much better to get the pieces, but we were pretty sure without yeah. any pieces and that this was, in true. fact, a rocky object. the question is also motivated by this idea that it could, not, it could be an artificial object. Well, if it were a, uh, something like one of our satellites coming in, that behaves differently Very in different, the atmosphere, yeah. and right. it looks different, mm -hmm. and it comes apart differently. Now, you can say exotic things, hey, it was a UFO or something. <laughs> Let's not go there. That, right. This was a rocky object of the right. sort that hit the Earth frequently. One of the big differences among the objects, which goes back to what do you do when you see one coming, is a comet, we now know the density. We've now gotten close enough to a couple of them to know how much stuff is packed together. And they're pretty loose and fluffy. So they break apart at a different atmosphere, amplitude in a different way a typical ordinary chondrite asteroid is maybe 15 to 20 percent empty space. And that's going to break apart in a different way. An iron body can be much denser and much more coherent. And that reaches your face. They're the ones that, that hit the surface. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, I have a final question for you. What do you want to see in your lifetime that could change the way we uh, study or search for this or try to protect our planet? What's, I, what's the priority? I would love to see a piece of an asteroid as big as my hand carried to me from the astronaut who went to that asteroid, picked it up, and said, this is interesting. A fresh, pristine... A fresh, pristine, 
Unaltered. Unaltered piece of an asteroid. Oh, wow. Brought to me by an astro astronaut. And you think this is going to happen in? I think it could happen. There is certainly a little bit of interest in NASA and a couple of people working on the project. Maybe with the kind of awareness we've gotten from these sorts of events, it could happen in our lifetime. I think that's going to happen before we go to Mars. Okay. That's nice. Well, I certainly can't top that. that that's a <laughs> wonderful wish. Let me just say, though, that <coughs> there has been talk for many years now of human visits to asteroids, not just to bring back a piece, but as a stepping stone to Mars, yeah. the ultimate place we want to go. It's a very long gap from the Earth-Moon system to Mars. Asteroids are probably the intermediate steps that will help us expand human presence Absolutely. into the inner solar system. Absolutely. Especially these near-Earth asteroids, just like the ones that came and visited us on the 15th. OK. Well, thank you very much. I think it's time to end this uh, Hangout. Uh, thanks again, you two, for your participation. And keep watching the sky. Yes. Absolutely. So this work highlights definitely the communicate campaign of the Science in uh, the, the City Institute. And uh, I hope you can all participate to the discussion. Uh, please join us on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus account. And uh, you can know a bit more about the City Institute by visiting our website at uh, city.org and also participate directly to the communicate campaign uh, joining <coughs> citystars.org. Thank you very much. <laughs>